before today's podcast begins, I want to quickly share a thought process that's been bugging me. I'm very blessed. I'm very protected. You can say I'm in this middle class bubble where the brunt of this pandemic isn't very much felt by me or my family or some of my closer peers. But because of this, I also feel quite useless that I can't do much. Uh, yes, I donate some money to some causes and I try to do what I can to give. But I feel that the battle is more internal for most people. And this is where I am thinking about at least offering my support or my help in the sense of being uh, a coach to anyone who needs it. And yes, this may sound like a sleazy pitch, but I don't want it to be that way. It's if, if it's something in it for me, it is just me being able to practice my coaching skills and I would very much want to do that. Uh, I enjoy speaking. I could speak and talk and listen for a whole day if I'm given the chance to. And hence, my career as a coach, right? But what I'm trying to say is if anyone needs a coach, uh, a life coach or a personal coach through some of the problems that they are facing in their work, in their life, I'm here. I have fellow coach graduates who are eager to help as well. So please feel free to reach out. Or even if you need any form of help, please feel free to reach out and I will try my best to help in any way possible. This podcast is called Mentors Among Us. It is with the intention of helping Malaysians live better lives. It's a very broad goal, I have to say, but it is what it is. It is an intention of mine. Helping Malaysians live better lives through having conversation with amazing Malaysians. And I just can't stand or sit aside and just not do anything amidst this um, helplessness that we are facing as a nation. Today we have Mr. Long Yun Siang. So a bit of a background of history of what he has done. He was an account director for Leo Burnett for six years and moving on to be an account director in JWT for two years, GM at DDB for seven years, currently co-founder and CEO at Raw Point for 12 years uh, as of 2021. Some of the clientele for Raw Point include like Family Mart, Aeroline, GSC, Maggie, some of the big household names of Malaysia. Uh, yeah. But what's most interesting, I think more people would uh, appreciate, is that you guys hold the Malaysia Book of Records for having the longest running business blog. Uh, Raw Points, R A W P O I N T S. Uh, Long is also an author of uh, three books Rethink Your Marketing Questions and Answers, 500 Questions to Inspire a Better Marketing Plan, and a book I was just reading about 12 hours ago. Let's do this. <laughs> So, Long, thank you so much again for taking up the time today to doing this podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And it, 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 it's my honor and I'm truly humbled that uh, you feel that I'm fitting for, for, for this particular slot of yours. Very much. Uh, I, I just want to share, right? Uh, last uh -huh. year before the pandemic, right? Uh, right. I, took, I, could, I took the marketing accelerator program offered by Raw Point. Right. Uh, after the second day, when I walked out of, uh, it was... I can't remember what hotel it is. It is in Mon Chiara, right? I walked down to the hotel. Yeah, yeah. Hyatt House, yeah. Hyatt House. And I instantly texted like five or six friends and tell them, hey guys, I think this would be really helpful for your business. Really helpful for your small business or helpful to bring you to where you want to be like, as a solopreneur, as a personal brand, as an SME. So five or six friends. I met a friend on the road on the way towards 163 more. I also told him about it. Spent about five, 10 minutes telling him, hey bro, this is a great program for you. Please consider taking it out. Can, Thank, you so much, not, not Thank you so much. Not not being paid to say this, by the way. Um, <laughs> so long. I just want to just want to start off the the podcast today, just to connect with you, right? I just want to know mm -hmm. how have you been holding up though this pandemic? Um, I suppose as a business owner and maybe as a dad as well. Mm -hmm. how, have, how have things mm -hmm. been? Uh, okay, so maybe I break it down into two sides: the professional side and the and the personal side. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the the professional side from from the first MCO. I don't know how many we have gone through. Um, from the first MCO, I, I remember clearly it was March uh, 2020, right? Till now, we kind of lost momentum, gained it back, lost momentum and gained it back uh, from, from a professional standpoint. 
Um, so the truth is that we there have been months that we have done very, very badly. Uh, there have been months and 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 thank God there have been months that we we kind of exceed our own expectations as well. Um, so all in all, in 2020, we did okay. Uh, in fact, we 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 managed to not lose money. I think that's the important part, lah, right? To actually survive through through it all. So we managed to do that. This year was the same thing. We're gonna gain some momentum and then lost some again. Um, so this time around, I have to say that uh, some clients obviously, um, because nothing is moving, so they are also not spending. They are not they are not planning that much as well. So from a professional standpoint, I think there's a little bit of anxiety, uh, even amongst myself and my business partner, one whom you have met, one whom before. Um, so that's that's one part of it. I think the good, let's talk about the good part. The good part is that we are, given that we have had one year of experience, right? Um, actually using it to do lots of planning. Um, in fact, um, some days, because we have we do have permit to, to function, because uh, we do some e-commerce for clients and things like that, so under e-commerce you're allowed to. Mm. Uh, we do we do do some planning ourselves and gearing up to when this whole madness is over. I think for a lot of uh, a lot of business people, they forget that the lull is actually a good time to plan. Um, you can panic. There's only so much that you can panic in 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 in, in a given time. Right? I think. Um, I like to use the the analogy of uh, in the safari, the 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 animal that the deer that reacts the fastest when the lion appears actually survive. The one that stares at the lion a slightly a one second more is the one that is going to be grabbed by the lion. So you cannot panic for okay. that long. I think we all humans we we all do that. So that's one side of it. I think the personal side of it is I've got three teenagers at home, my wife is working from home, so there are like five different colleagues I have now. <laughs> so that's a little bit tough and then even trying to trying to um, separate personal time and professional time. I, I think my story is very similar to others and I, I, I try to help out with, with the cooking and all that, all, all those sort of things. I think there's a little bit of this, this whole thing about how do you separate and say that I am delivering towards my company? Because we are all responsible for our company, right? So our company is an entity, right? You also have responsibility to your staff. You have responsibility to your business partner. So you don't want to quote unquote cheat the company's time, lah. So I mean, that's that's me. So that that that, that kind of give me a little bit of a, a little bit of getting used to for for myself personally. So so that's that's how I've been dealing with the MCO, lah. Thank you for the the update. Um, yeah. I one thing that I hear you say and that has been very there's been like a common theme that Raw Point and yourself have been <coughs> have been sharing right this past year and a half almost is mm. that a crisis presents an opportunity uh, a crisis presents an opportunity just succinct like that and yeah. I think one thing I I hear you wrote about is that during times of crisis. Um, even a whisper becomes a roar. And companies mm. and brands that are present to the consumers uh, mm -hmm. are deemed to be more trustworthy and more dependable as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes, yes. Can you elaborate yes. a little bit about, about that? Though? Okay, um, just a very simple concept, right? So there's a proverb, out of sight means out of mind. And I think it's, it's more true in, 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 in branding and in marketing. Um, if you think about it, I think um, most people are very familiar with sales funnel and, and, and things like that. So if I just use uh, sales funnel as a as a model, uh, there are many models that we can use. It, we let's let's use that because most people are familiar with it. Uh, if you use a sales funnel and and you think about it as awareness, interest, desire, and action. So whether you are doing digital or traditional, although you know my view that digital and traditional is actually the same. The sales funnel is the same. It's just the, the details are different. So if you want the bottom of, of the funnel, which is your sales or your action, or your purchase to increase, your top of the funnel has to be there. So it all begins with awareness. If I don't know you, I won't be able to connect with you. I won't be able to purchase you. I won't be able to experience you, whatever the term that you want to use. Um, so for a very simple, very simple, uh, another proverb from the Malay proverb that I like to use, tak kenal maka tak cinta. So to kenal means to build that awareness, right? So think about it. Um, we have a term in the industry we call share of voice. So the share of voice now, you can easily 
climb up on the share of voice because most of your, most of your competitors are not spending. Are not spending. Now, I'm not saying go out there and spend maximum, go out there and spend your full budget. Be wise, right? Look at your category. Look at your category. And what is, what is your marketing objective for right now? Are you trying to drive awareness? Are you trying to drive sales? Right? But even if you are trying to drive sales, you, your, your, your bottom of the funnel cannot be packed filled with number of people unless the top is filled because there's always a conversion rate, right? Mm. So that's what I mean. So you, you, even a whisper can be a roar depending on how you spend and when you spend. But that spending, or I like to call it the investment, has got to be there. That's why it's called brand equity. It, it, you, you need to invest behind it before you get the brand equity back. You see? And it takes time. Right? Okay, okay. This, this resonates, uh, or this, maybe the right word would be, this counters an opinion that I have recently came across. And I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about it because um, mm. one thing that has always been maybe promoted in the solopreneur or the small brand or the personal brand, SME, mm. I'm kind of mm -hmm. grouping all of this into one, is that you want to distinguish yourself not so much by being better, but by mm -hmm. being different. So yeah. I think the example that has always been given, or the, the classic example is Volkswagen, right? When it came out mm -hmm. with the Beetle, for example, in the early 30s or 40s, 1930s or 40s, they don't mm -hmm. go down the traditional route where every car was square. The bigger it is, the better it is. Big, shiny tires or big engines, right? They build a mm -hmm. very... This is the thing about the classic Mr. Bean kind of Volkswagen Beetle, la, the old school Beetle. Right. And because they embraced that uniqueness or that that uh, difference, right? They were very successful in the numbers and the revenues and all that. Mm -hmm. Would you say this is a... Well, mm -hmm. What would you say this would mean to the personal brand? I know this sounds like a huge, long question. And I, I don't know where I yeah. led myself to. But yeah. marketing by being different. And when you do that, right? Mm -hmm. Where does competition... Mm -hmm. How do you even view competition if you are creating a category of your own? Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it's, it's an ex excellent question, really. Very, very good question. Um, it's also going to be a long answer. Okay, let, let, let me use the... Since you talked about the Volkswagen um, example, right? Mm. Um, marketing by being different, um, marketing by being distinctive, I think has, has always existed, whether you, you, you talk about very classical marketing thinking or even the, the new, new way of of uh, marketing thinking. I think it all goes back to, and you have heard me um, say this before, um, it all goes back to how do you do marketing planning? R marketing planning, if you will, if, if, if I can borrow your uh, imagination and, and also the those of your listeners, um, just kind of imagine three columns. So there are three columns. There is um, the first column on the left-hand side is actually the diagnosis. The middle column is actually the strategy. And then the third column is actually the tactics. So within the diagnosis column, there are actually three things there, three components. So first component is market orientation, okay? Or we can use a term called consumer centricity. The second, the second item there is market research. The third item there would be segmentation. So you kind of have to get the diagnosis right. Okay, no, no difference from a lot of uh, professional job, whether you're an accountant or a personal trainer or a marketing consultant like this, you kind of need to know the background, right, of your consumer, of the situation that you need to be in. So what is market orientation? Basically, there are many different kind of companies. There are companies that is very product oriented, companies that is very advertising oriented, uh, companies that is very sales oriented. So whether you're talking about SME, personal branding or not, uh, it's the same. It's the same. So if I take... Uh, personal trainers, for example, there are those who feel that, well, if I keep promoting myself on digital, I'll get more clients. So they are very advertising oriented, right? There are, there are gyms that is very sales oriented. They get lots of salespeople to go out there and do sales and all that, right? Now, if you're, so obviously to us, the best answer is you have to be consumer oriented, which means that your orientation is towards what does the consumer want? Who are my consumers and what do they want, right? Now, obviously, when you start there, it kind of empty. You, you don't know. You have inklings, you have hypotheses, but you, you don't really know. And that's where the market research comes in. And I know a lot of people will say that, look, I'm an SME, I'm a solo proner, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a small-time business person. What market research are you talk, do you talk about? 
Well, if you're a big company, you obviously do very sophisticated research. If you're a small company, then do whatever that you can do, but never go in blind without any diagnosis because then you have no information at all. You'll be poking in the dark, right? Then the third one would be segmentation. So this is the important part. The segmentation means now that you have a market orientation, you ask yourself, within the market that I'm in, how many types of consumers are there? So you can break it down. So you say, look, there are six different types of uh, SMEs out there, right? Um, say, for example, it, it, the way that we do our segmentation, we say that there are, there are six different types. There are the strugglers, people who can't even meet the numbers on a monthly basis. There are those who are really up there 10 years and above. Um, they have the money to invest and all that. So you look at the segments that you have. That's the whole part of diagnosis. You're not making any decision. You're not making any plans. You're only finding out what and who should I be looking at. So that is, that's the diagnosis. The second column now is you have reached strategy. Okay, strategy is made out of three items. Target, position, and your objective. These three things together becomes your marketing strategy. So now that you have looked at the segmentation, this is where the hard call is. You got to ask yourself, who do I target as my core consumer? My core clientele, my core people. Okay, once you know that, your positioning comes easy. Now that's the short answer to your question, to differentiate, to be distinctive. It all comes in the positioning. Your positioning, if I do a very classic way of doing positioning statement would be who am I for, how am I different versus who. There will always be a versus who. So Volkswagen obviously took a versus who, right? And what are the benefits that I deliver? So that differentiates you, that allows you to take a position. So that position means a position in the consumer's mind. Right? Now, benefits, it, it can be product features, it can be product benefits, it can be emotional benefits, all, all those kind of leathering. Right, It works across different categories. Then you talk about the objective. So a lot of people don't start with what is it that you want to achieve. For some brands, it could be awareness. In fact, for, for 80, 90, I, I'm just um, giving a guess to me, 80, 90% of SMEs out there you, you suffer from a brand awareness issue. Mm. It's not that you don't have sales. It's people don't know you. So what is your marketing objective? If you say, look, amongst um, teenagers 15 to 19 years old, I would like to be the alternative snacks and I am selling ubi crepe in a cooler fashion. So versus who? So I don't know, versus frito Lays versus Twisties. Then you're taking a position. I see. I see. Then what is your objective? Your objective obviously is not, we all want to sell, but before that, what is the issue? The issue is nobody knows you. So your marketing objective then becomes awareness first. So I'm not saying, so a lot of people say, oh, Mr. Long, you talk easy, you're not selling. You have to sell. We, we all understand that. But if you don't have the awareness, the sales isn't going to come. And obviously you don't just have one marketing objective. You can have a, a few. So then you're aligned. That's the strategy. Okay. That's the strategy. So that's where the, that differentiation, that positioning comes in. And that's how you make position work. So positioning isn't a statement and say, oh, that's the statement. But how do you communicate it? Right? Then the third pillar is where the tactics is. And this is where a lot of people misconstrue. They think that the tactics is where the four P's are. And a lot of people think the four P's is actually the strategy. It's not. The four P's is the tactic. Social because... media is a strategy. That's yeah, 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 exactly, right? So the tactics are your product, your price, your, your promotion. I like to use the term integrated marketing communications. Uh, yeah. So mm. your, your, your digital is actually in there. And your distribution. Why? Why are these tactics? Because once you know who you're going after, the position that you want and your objective, these are the four gears that you play with, right? Mm. So if I'm targeting teenagers, what, what kind of pocket money do they have? How much do they spend? 
Then you can adjust the pricing. You can adjust. You can adjust the price. You can adjust your SKU, your stock keeping unit. Does it have to be a big pack, small pack? Where do you distribute? Do you want to do a direct to consumer brand, for mm. example, because you're small, but with the longer term that you want to be a national brand, therefore traditional distribution is important. How do you communicate? Okay, because I don't have money. My objective is to gear up for awareness. Therefore, maybe integrated communication is not fitting for me right now. I will just use digital. Those are the gears that you play with, but a lot of people start with the tactics. Yep, yep. You see, understood. So it's a long answer to your. <laughs> no, long answers are what I appreciate. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. That is that is a long answer, but a, a nice little summary of what I uh, have learned through the accelerator accelerator program last year, la. So yeah. thank you again for sharing that. Um, no reason. We we went from zero to hundred miles per hour so very very fast. So. Uh, okay. Pardon me if I take a mini step back. Yeah, I just want to know sure. um, how how did you end up with marketing? Or the question that I've, that I've written here is how did marketing become your life's work? Um, I don't even know how. Where should I go back to? Uh, um, okay. I, initially, interestingly, what what happened is I yeah, to go back to to my to my rebellious teenage years. Uh, so when I was in Form 6, right until, right until I was in Form 6, I had always wanted to be a lawyer, right? Mm. And so I kind of disappointed my, my father when I said, hey, I want to do communications. In, in reality, I don't know much about communications. And I, it just appealed to me because um, journalism at that time was actually under, under communications. And I thought I, I, I really enjoyed doing that. So when I, went to, when I went to uni, a lecturer actually came up to me and said that, do you want to change your major? Uh, from journalism to, to, to advertising. And I said, why? He said, because it's easier. Um, two things. They said, one, knowing Chinese, right? I don't think they like their children to be journalists because journalists don't make a lot of money. So I, I think she was half joking, but, but really, I really appreciated that, that advice. And interestingly, what happened was that my father was elated because, oh, advertising sounds like marketing. So I said, oh, that's, that's very good. Right, so I, I, because of that little advice from the lecturer, I actually switched from journalism to advertising. And because I got into communications advertising, I did lots of marketing um, courses because you, you they, because they overlap, right? Although they are in different schools, and that's how I got I how I got into uh, marketing and communications. And as I went along, I think in my in my younger years as as a young executive in the industry. One way I look at it is this, is no different from being a lawyer because you're actually fighting a case for the, for the brand on a daily basis, right? You're putting their story, their version of the story out there. You're putting their version of their, of their proposition out there to mm. the consumers. Um, I think I, I had the blessing of being able to work with brilliant people. Uh, my, my early colleagues in, in Liu Burnett, uh, JWT and DDB, they are really, really, really brilliant people. Um, I mean, I, I worked with the likes of Zhu Hong and Hua and obviously Yasmin and Ali and Richard, Sean, um, Alex, people like that. Uh, they're really brilliant people. And, 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 and I think once you get into it and you really put your pride, passion and belief into the things that you do, I think it can thrill you for, for a very, very long time. Yeah. Then uh, that's, how, that's how I got into it. Uh -huh. Yeah. One, one thing that I find that's very unique about Raw Point, and this is written, and this is one of your, uh, it's not one of your commandments, but one of your approaches to your business is mm. that you do not pitch. And you're not a fan of pitching. And yeah. you strongly believe in that, whereas that has always been the industry standard. Um, you're right. Could you, could you explain to um, the listeners, what do you mean when you say marketing pitch? And why okay. don't you do it as well? Okay. Uh, so for those who are not familiar, uh, in, in the advertising industry, um, there's, there's, there's a common practice to pitch for the work, which means that normally a client will call a few companies and they basically give a brief to the company and say, okay, this is my objective. This is what I want to do. Now you come back with a proposal, right? That proposal is actually a pitch. So you're pitching it to the client. You're throwing it to the client and you're saying that uh, this uh, based on the, the challenges and the objective that you have, this is what we feel you should be doing for your brand. 
And normally they'll tell they'll tell three to five companies. Um, we have heard some horrendous one with twenty over companies have been has been briefed on it, right? Then all these company comes back with full blown work, show it to the client, and then the client decides your fate whether you will be chosen and therefore be given the job or not. Now to be fair, the the ad industry, the ad advertising uh, association has for the longest time been able to implement a pitch fee. Now the pitch fee only works if you belong to the association. So for association members, if you call any of the association member, um, you would actually be told that you need to pay a pitch fee depending on the budget. Uh, I haven't kept, kept up to pace with what the, what the association is charging now, but you will be asked to pay a pitch fee. For many companies, my company is not a member of the four A's, uh, so we we are not guided by that. Uh, we're not guided by that. We are not. Um, so we we don't have to charge a pitch fee if we don't want to. But it's it's my lifelong belief from from a very young um, professional age that I think pitching, and I'm not saying all clients are like that. There are many clients who are like that. There are many prospects who are like that. Uh, it's an easy way to get free ideas. Just tell two or three companies. Um, they all come back. You may not pick company C, but you like company C's idea. You give to company A because company A is cheaper. And you take the idea and you can't copyright ideas anyway. Oh. It, and, and yeah, so so it, 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 many companies actually do that. And, and if I really discourage people from doing it, um, uh, companies from pitching mainly because I, I think if you believe... So you go back to positioning, right? If you believe in your own work that your quality is good and your pricing is right, I think you should hold the line. Okay. You think you should hold the line. I, th I think it goes back to branding of a marketing consultancy or advertising consultancy or any consultancy for that matter, right? So the common example that you, you have heard me say is that a doctor don't pitch for your work. A lawyer don't pitch for your work. You don't walk into a doctor's office and say, hey, doctor, you, I got this condition, you propose how you will treat me, and then you tell me how much you will charge, and I decide whether I want to use you as a doctor or not. You don't, right? Mm. Neither does a lawyer or an accountant. So why, why should marketing professionals like us, um, who have spent years being trained uh, to do the right thing for brands and marketing, then be called to pitch? I think it, it shouldn't be done. It shouldn't be done. Yeah. I think that echoes with one of the Ten Commandments that you guys have, everything has a story to be told. And I think that is, that is a strong story that kind of symbolizes what Raw Point believes in and by extension, but what you, yourself, and your co-founder, your partner, Wan Hoon, believes in. I just want to highlight that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I want to go into uh, a little bit of history of um, some of the past projects that you have uh, taken, you have done. Uh, mm. In, in the industry, not so much maybe maybe through your previous companies, maybe through Raw Point, right? Mm. What was one of the most challenging projects that you've taken up in in your industry, in marketing? Wow. Oh, good question. I would say two. Okay. Uh, two, two, that, two of that will come to mind. One is uh, PIDM. So PIDM is Prabadanan Deposit Insurance Malaysia. All right. Mm. Uh, you see the logos outside banks and all that. Um, I was actually the, the the client services director at that time in uh, in DDB, and it was actually the 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 project is actually interesting in the sense that um, from from even the very very first beginning. So the 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 deposit insurance corporation, right? Perbadan Perbadan Deposit uh, Insur Perbadan Insurance Deposit Malaysia PIDM. Um, actually, has, is a statutory body that needs to be set up, and it needs to be set up uh, with uh, by the Act of Parliament, and it's actually part of the Master Malaysian Master Financial Plan, right? Uh, by the ex Governor Zeti. So that part of the whole Malaysian Financial Master Plan is to set up the De Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, it was a little bit technic from a technical standpoint, it was a bit sticky, mainly because. If the act is not started, then it's very difficult for you to, to start developing and things like that, right? Um, so to cut a long story short, what we did at that time was there was a task force in Bank Nagara that is in charge of setting this up because the corporation obviously didn't exist. And we went in, we went in for a pitch 
uh, it was a pitch by 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 Bank Negara, and um, it, I have huge huge respect for the Bank Negara folks, right? Very very professional, highly highly intelligent folks. Uh, we actually won the pitch. We actually won the pitch, and we had a very a, a group of very very young people. Um, why is it challenging? Mainly because PIDM has nothing to sell. For the first time in my career, um, we work on a pitch where you have nothing to sell. All you have to sell is an idea. And the idea that you need to sell to the Malaysian public, to the Rakyat, is that in the highly unlikely event of a bank going bankrupt, right, you don't need to rush to the bank. Your, your deposits are all covered by the Deposit Insurance Corporation of Malaysia, and they will actually send you a check. And that's all there is to it. Mm. So why is it challenging? Because you, obviously you can guess, right? When you start talking like that, Malaysians will be thinking, oh, Scared. is that going to happen? Otherwise the government won't start this and all that. So we, we, we even have to prepare, we even for the plan itself, we even have to prepare uh, like crisis plans and things like that. It was, I think, the, the biggest full-blown plan that I have ever seen that I have ever uh, done uh, and not, not just seen I've ever done so that was that was huge I think uh, it, it's very very challenging um, we, we, we were a very very young team but we pulled it through so that's something that I remember and, and of course at that time we were we were joking that you know it's one of those stories that we can tell uh, even our future generations because most of the time most of the time right the government don't change these kind of logos very often. So you say, you know, when your grandfather, you can tell your grandson, he actually did this, right? So that's one. The other one, the other very challenging one is actually Munchies. Um, 19 years ago uh, was the, my first foray into starting my own business. Uh, Munchies was actually my first client. Um, and, and every Friday I would actually travel down uh, and I work with CK. Mm. Uh, they, the family no longer owns, no longer owns. So this was the film radio, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, in two zero one eight, um, and I worked very, very closely with with CK. In fact, I ran like a marketing manager for him at the time. He didn't kind of have a marketing manager. Uh, in fact, his team was very, very small. Um, great people, fantastic family. Um, in fact, CK has become a, a a personal friend. It's challenging mainly because uh, for a brand like theirs, they have huge potential. Really, really huge potential. Mainly um, at that time, I've already spent about. I think 16, 17 years in, in the marketing and in, in advertising industry, I could pick up nuggets of things that says, hey, I think they can be very successful and what were some of the marketing issues that they had and what needed to be kind of put in place and they would actually fly. Um, and there was in fact the, the, the precise uh, uh, conversation I had with CK at that time. And obviously because they are SME, so this, this goes out to all the SMEs that is listening. There are, there are certain criteria, there are certain things that can that that uh, uh, experienced consultant can, is able to tell you what are some of those checkpoints, right? The the check boxes that you can kind of you're almost there, right? And what are the missing parts that you need to put together in order to fly? Um, of course, I have CK to thank to be able to have that case study as well. I mean, he had he had faith and confidence in my professionalism and all that, and obviously the family. Um, so he kind of invested behind it. Um, I still remember the, the figure very clearly. In fact, CK even remembered the figure very, very clearly. Um, it, it was a huge figure, it's 400,000 ringgit, the first time that we spent. So I think um, anyone with experience working in a SME company, family base, uh, you would know asking asking for the kind of budget of 400,000, mm. and that was 19 years ago. Even, even now, I don't think it's loose change. I think it's, it's yes, a substantial yes, figure for a lot. Yeah. And they had they had they had faith and say okay let's do this. I still remember very clearly. CK held my elbow and said, "You sure? How long?" I said, "Let's let's go. Let's do this." I I I, I am. Of course, I can't be sure. If I'm sure, I'll be a millionaire now. But I'm very confident this can work. So so that 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 kind of set the platform for for him. And 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 I'm glad that CK still still talks about it. I mean, when he and I talk, we still talk about okay. the fact that you know it's it's something that is it, one of my Highlights. bigger case studies. Uh. Okay, what, how, if you could, if it's not PNC, right, how did you guys allocate that 400k? Um, because I can't remember. Okay, I can't remember very clearly now. Um, I, I remember a little bit of it. And it, again, it goes back to very classical marketing thinking, right? 
integrated marketing communication. So why do I keep saying integrated marketing communications? I think there were a few things that, that um, at that point, um, 19 years ago, uh, that we, we needed to fix. I think one was awareness. I think most people know them because they have huge distribution. So the distribution channel is actually, um, I would say, fixed, as in they, they were doing very well in terms of distribution. I think the, the, the big thing is awareness of knowing who Munchies is and what Munchies is. So I think a lot of the budget was actually allocated on um, uh, TV advertising. Um, I know a lot of people don't believe in TV advertising now. My my, And I say this cautiously, so it doesn't work for all categories. For certain categories, a TV could be your killer app, right? If I borrow a sexy term for it. Um, okay. At that time, it, it definitely was. Uh, we did TV. Um, we also did kind of like a feature, a feature with TV3, um, kind of like a Majala TV, uh, a Majala Tiger program, in order to add credibility that this is not your backyard factory. I mean, they had a very sophisticated factory in, in Tongang Pacha in Batu Pahat. So we, we had cameras rolling to show that, you know, these are all HACCP compliant and things like that. So they kind of added to the credence, to the credence of it. And, and then beyond that, uh, those days, um, not those days, uh, even now on ground is important. I think a lot of people don't think about on ground now because of this whole, you know, um, pooling of the digital and, uh, you know, the direct to consumer and all that. Right, by we, on ground, you mean newspaper ads or? No, no, on ground means in, in store, in okay. store. Okay. So we had gondola, we had gondola displays and things like that. And we had TV. Um, for some viewers, you may have forgotten at one point we have, tapes that are called VHS tapes, right? Mm. So we, we we kind of recorded the TV commercial in the VHS tape. We would, we would play it in the video and then sort of give people a reminder of we have seen this on TV before, right? It's it's here. It's right here. So those those are some of the integrated communications thing that we, we actually did uh, 19 years ago for, for Munchies. And I think that, that created the kind of the groundswell, the awareness and the, the affinity for the brand. Okay, yeah. okay. When you said that the company uh, flew, what did, mm. what did that mean though? Uh, if you could paint a number or a picture on that. Um, the first campaign, yeah. the sales went up 150%. Okay. So of course, for detractors, the, the, the thing will be, well, you're starting from ground zero. But even then, right, it's 150%. What was their, so, what was Munchies, uh, sorry, what was Munchies' um, signature product, if you remember? Because in my mind, Let's say, for example, Kraft has Oreo. Danone, mm. Danone has chips more. What was Munchies? Yeah? Um, I, I, I have not worked on Munchies for the longest <laughs> time, but I always observe, I always observe them on the side because it's it's a brand that's very close to my heart. Mm. Um, I would say it's music. Um, at that time, uh. um, uh, it, it it would be music. In fact, music was the one that we launched. Uh, I think it's still it's still very big now. Mm. It's still very big now, but I, I don't know what is the company's uh, focus on the on the pro, uh, product portfolio strategy and, and and all that right now. But but that was one at, at that time. Uh, the the company was really really proud of their wafer product, um, and and music was really up there together with the the competing with the imported brands. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. the wafer cube that comes in. Um, That's squares, right. That's or, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's sorry. Right. Thanks for sharing that. Very interesting no story, and uh, I mean, when it's if, if it's a household product like that, and everyone has um exposure to, I feel like we can appreciate marketing, advertising, branding um mm. more, right? Because mm. in, in di directly or indirectly, your actions or what you have done has brought that product into to our minds as consumers. So sure. it, it has always until I took the course with you guys last year, marketing and advertising, branding has always been a a thought at the back of my mind. It has never been like a concrete a one plus one equals to two kind of thing until mm. you you help piece things together. So I just want to mention that. Thank you. Okay. Another interesting thing that I want to talk about is one of the the as I mentioned earlier, the awards that you have won. And when I okay. when I read the article, I was laughing because it says longest blog in Malaysia, yeah. longest business blog in Malaysia. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure they had uh, they were intending to do some wordplay with that title. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
I'm I'm curious. What are the lessons? Some of the lessons that you learned through daily, almost daily, right? Six days, five days a week, blogging, mm. and why? Why? Why do so? Um, I think the 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 first the first one is that I actually started it. I think with like with most most of these kind of projects, right? Mm. I didn't start it by saying, um, well, I'm going to be the longest. A daily business blog and, and all that. I actually started it mainly to kind of voice certain opinions that um, it's very difficult for us as professionals. Sometimes you don't want to offend clients and things like that. Sometimes certain advice that you want to give clients is difficult to give. Um, that's one. The other one is I, I always have this, um, perhaps it's a personal philosophy to, to, to share learnings. So one of my favorite um, statements is that I've paid the fees, right? You get to learn the lesson for free. So there, there may be things that I have come across, there may be things, experiences that I've come across that I want to share with other people. Um, if I don't have a platform, it's very difficult to, to, to share this uh, widely. So I, I started the blog by asking questions and then answering them myself. And for, for people who, like-minded people, uh, who read the blog, they, they, they can understand and they can take the lessons from it. So that's that's number one. Uh, why why I started it? I think the the other reason why I started it is actually to keep myself sharp. Mm. I think as as um, so I'm a very kiasu guy. Right, I read a lot and I write a lot because I think those are my sharpness. Right, so I can be I can I continue to be sharp. I mean I'm I'm at a tenderish age of fifty two. There are people who are thirty two. You know they can work longer hours and have more energy than than I do. So how do I keep my competitiveness? I th- I, th- I think. Um, as consultants, we need to be very sharp uh, all the time, um, not to pretend to have all the answers. So how how do I how do I keep myself sharp besides reading? I think is to think through things and 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 you, you read the blog, um, you you know the style is always a question and an answer, mm. and and most of the time it, it doesn't answer it directly. It kind of flips it a bit, so it, it opens up my own mind as well into how how do you how do you um, look at things from a different angle. So um, to answer your question, what 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 have I learned from it? I think a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, it continues to affirm my belief that discipline is important, right? Um, is to say that when the time comes for you to do something, you just have to do it. There's no negotiation with yourself. So if you write it every day, then it's every day there's no... Uh, it's okay, la. I don't think people will notice. Seriously, I think if I don't write for a day, I, I don't think a lot of readers will know, right? But but it's discipline. I, I think it affirms that discipline is important and you should keep going. Uh, secondly, I think the, the kind of commitment that you, you give yourself, I think you, at the end of the day, you're answerable to yourself and nobody else, la. whatever that it is. I, I, I think that's, that's important. The third one is to think long-term and not to be too hard on yourself because there are days that I... In fact, if you ask me, I think maybe I, I, I hate 40, 50% of the things that I write. Right? So, <laughs> okay. so, so to, to learn to cut yourself some slack and say that if you think long term, then it's okay. Right? I mean, I have 2,000 over blocks now. And if I say I, I hate 50% of it, well, okay, there's still 1,000 that I quite like, right? Mm. which I will never have if I don't do this. So it's, it, one lesson that I learned is always to think long term and 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 tell yourself, let's see what happens. Okay. Right? Well, yeah. your your failures and your successes are what determines who you are, right? Not so much just yeah. the highlights, right? Um, yeah. yeah. And, and that's, when you say discipline, is something that I, I resonate with a lot because it's something that has always been very difficult for me. Um, mm. I find that, and I mean, may or may not be speaking for a lot of people around my generation, but there is this sense of hopping from project to project. Mm. You do something for a while, you realize, ah, see now this one maybe not for me lah. I try something else lah. <laughs> ah, yeah, uh. cannot lah. I do something else lah. And yeah. and it's something I want to cover a bit later. But what is your creation schedule or routine like? I'm just curious. Do you write first thing in the morning, pre inputs? Mm. Do you write immediately when you have like an insight, or how does it go? How do you go about it? Okay, there are a few ways, right? Uh, if I kind of have to group it together. Mm. Um, there will be... So I, I, I have done... Because I've done it for 9 to 10 years now, uh, I don't have an actual schedule. 
So mm. I have various ways of doing it. So certain certain periods, I will have very good spurts, very good run. I'll give you an example. Um, the last the last MCO one year ago, I could actually generate easily 60, 70 um, pieces of, uh, of, of blocks in that one month uh, because there were a lot of time to think. Uh, there were a lot of um, materials mm. out there. Uh, in fact, I even started uh, the framework of a, of a, of a book um, during that period. Mm. So one way is always I set time aside. So most of the time, I either set Sunday night or Saturday afternoon, depending on my mood. So I, I, I am at a level where I can gauge whether I can, I can be productive or not because I've been doing it that long, right? So those are set kind of set time that I would do. Um, and how I do it is that if it's a set time, I sit down and write it, I tell myself I am not going to get up until I finish 10. Wow. 10. Right? So, yeah. So you, 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 you don't negotiate yourself. You just tell yourself 10 or you don't get up. Mm. Right? So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is, um, I call it always putting your antenna up now. In your conversations, in people's Facebook posts, there are always content that is shouting at you to say, please write about me, right? Um, irritating things that friends talk about that you disagree, but look, you don't have time because you're rushing off. <laughs> like, okay, I will reply you, but I'll, I mean, you say in your heart, I'll reply you already in the blog, right? Mm. So there are a lot of content that is out there because if you have an opinion or you have a position on something, um, that in itself is content. So normally what I'll do is either I type it in the phone or I'll write it down somewhere. So I capture those kind of things. And, and those are the easy weeks because once you capture them, you learn to be able to just kind of translate it very, very quickly. So, I mean, if in a week, someone inspires you, someone pisses you off uh, something that you want to tell a staff, but you just decided that it's better to kind of put it in a blog because then more people can learn about it. Mm. You're going to have three, four things to write about. That covers kind of like the whole week already, okay. right? So that's the, the second way I used to write. The third way is I read a lot. So every time I read, I may or may not agree with the writer. So every time I read, I'll always have a, a piece of paper next to me. I kind of write down and say, no, I, I, I disagree with this mm. and why I disagree with this and kind of write it on the side. So those are the, the three different ways that, that, that I do my writing. Okay. Yeah. Who would you say your um, target audience, if it is intended to have a target mm. audience? Because I know it sounds to me very much like you write to, as you said, sharpen your mind for yourself to really log your own thoughts, right? But if mm. there were any target audience, and I am one of them, uh, funnily mm -hmm. enough, right? I'm not sure whether I fit into any criteria of uh, a person that you, you intend to market to. But yeah. who would you say your target audience for your blog is? Um, my target audience on my blog is basically um, SME business owners. Mm. Um, and this category of SME business owners, they are gen generally um, slightly more intellectual. Um, I, I think you've seen the way the, the way that I've written. Uh, if you don't have a certain level of intellect, I think it's a little bit difficult to catch the innuendos and the, and the meaning behind certain words and the, and the questions to it. Um, why? Because I want to work with like-minded people. So if you don't dig my blog, if you don't, you don't have to agree to it, but you just have to understand where you're coming from. Then I know you're the right market that we can work with. Okay. I think that's, that's one. The, the, the other one is also, there are also SMEs. Um, and all I want them to do is please think differently. Please think differently. Don't, don't drink the Kool-Aid. I mean, don't think that digital is the end all be all. And don't think that, DTC is the end all be all. I mean, these are all the things that I've been hearing, right? Well, DTC and all that. So what does DTC stand for? A direct to consumer brands. They, it's the, I, I think it's the, I don't know if it's over now. Uh, I still hear people talk about it. Oh, do a DTC brand and all that. Uh, direct to consumer brands. So they don't rely on traditional uh, distribution channels and all that. So you literally buy from them, they send it to you and, 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 and all. Okay. So, my message to, to the SMEs is that think differently. So if you read the blog, I hope you start to think differently. You start to kind of broaden your mind a bit and, and understand that um, the elephant that you're describing, you are probably just describing the ear 
or the trunk or the tail. You're not describing the whole elephant because you're not seen the whole elephant yet. So if you take a step back and you mm. see a bigger picture, then you realize for now, your understanding is correct for now. Mm. But be ready and be open to change your mind when someone shows you something bigger. Uh, okay. Yeah, so so that's that's the intention of the blog, and those are the two main targets. I think beyond that are younger people, um, people who may not be businessmen, they could be employees and all that. So you 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 probably can tell that I don't always write about marketing and branding and all that. I, I talk about kind of like personal development and, and things like that. Uh, it's for them to kind of learn, just for them to kind of learn up as well. Okay, like okay. That. When when you say that elephant analogy that you just mentioned, right? Um, one thing that I wanted to ask, but I'm not sure how I can kind of fit it into this whole podcast, but I'm just going to ask it anyway, is yeah. the fact that um, what do you think about kind of just banging walls and learning as you go? Because I feel mm. like there's so many strategies out there for mm. people to learn these days. There's various different tactics for a business to quote-unquote succeed that mm. for me at least, right, it feels to me, it, it reaches, it kind of reaches a point where it paralyzes me. Um, yeah. How would you, what, 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 how would you think about just going for it and then mm. learning as you go, making all the mistakes and then after that, just, make, what, what I'm trying to say is not having a perfect quote-unquote marketing strategy when you first begin. How, how would you think about that? Yeah, I, I agree with it. In fact, I, I will tell you right now, Raw Point went through, the same path, banging on walls and 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 taking all the wrong decisions and 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 all that in order to arrive where we are. Are we at a perfect marketing plan right now in order to market ourselves and brand ourselves? I, I think no, no. In fact, I I will be, I will be humble enough to 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 say to the public right now. One Hoon and I we used to joke when we first came out from the multinational ad agencies with big founders names behind us. Right, it's easy to do the work. You know, you flash your name card, it says Leo Burnett, it says JWT, it says DDB, you know, Daldin and Burnbach. Burnbach, the guy who did all the Volkswagen ad that you, you talked about, right? It's easy. And you, the, the our own inside joke is that we were like zoo animals, fret for the first time into the safari. We don't know how to hunt. We don't know how to hunt. You are an entrepreneur now. You're no longer a marketing consultant. You're a marketing consultant stroke entrepreneur. Mm. How are you going to get the sales? Right? You're very good at, with the top of the funnel if I use the, the same term again. How are you going to get people to act upon what you're going to pitch them, right? And say, hey, you need me. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, I, I, I'm a big proponent of that. But I would add to that using my own experience. Well, what do you do? You don't have a plan. So one of the philosophy I have is a good plan executed now is better than an excellent plan executed tomorrow, right? Nice. Put a plan together, you execute. The important thing is, and I'm a big proponent of writing things down. I mean, have a book, you want to do it electro electronically, capture it. Why? Because you will forget and capture the details as well. So I've used another example that I mentioned earlier. So the, the signals for content is all out there, right? So when I write down the content, I will usually write it slightly deeper. Okay, I was talking to Bradley and Bradley mentioned this and I kind of agree with it or disagree with it and why. So when I come back to it, it's easier to write about, mm. okay? I've gone in a roundabout way to explain why is it important to document. So you have a plan. You don't know if it's a perfect plan. You just know that this is my plan. I'm going to do it. I accept that I'm going to make a mistake. Write down your objective. Otherwise, you cannot evaluate. This is where I'm going. I want to be. This is what I'm doing. I'm not getting there. Why am I not getting there? Then you, you can adjust it. Otherwise, most SMEs, uh, they tell you they have a plan, but it's not written. <laughs> right? So if it's not written, it's not counted. It has to be written somewhere where you can revisit. Okay. So I'm a big proponent of it. Do it. Experiment with it. If it's not working, so give yourself a timeline and say, look, I think it needs about a year. So don't stop until it's a year. Don't stop until it's six months. Mm. Don't stop until it's three months. Whatever that timeline is, but give it a bit of time. Because things need adjustment. You see? Okay, okay. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why, and I speak for myself, um, that these are the things that kind of paralyze me is because 
I've been brought up, and I'm pretty sure maybe in your generation you've been brought up to be in quote unquote the traditional education system, right? Yeah. Where things have to be perfect, lah. In in a way that oh, you write it this way, wrong. You gotta follow this rule, follow that rule. So maybe that's why there's a hesitancy to really just begin imperfectly, and mm. I don't know whether other solopreneurs or personal brand people struggle with that, but it is certainly something that I struggle with, lah. Got to get this font right. You use this font color, not nice. Cannot. It doesn't resonate with your guests and whatnot. Yeah. Social media, yeah. you got to post this. Cannot post this. Post at this certain time. I yeah. think a lot of that is um, as uh, well as Seth Godin puts it. Right, it's an easy way to hide from doing yeah. what you're supposed to do. Like, and I know you're a huge fan of uh, Seth Godin as well. Yes, yes, I am. I am. I am. Um, yeah. I'm going to just turn the conversation into um, how things are done these days, right? And I use the yeah. word these days very broadly. Mm. I'm pretty sure, and you can tell me what you think about this, that advertising, marketing, branding has changed a lot since the 90s when you began your career. Mm. Um, and I suppose the often quoted reason is because attention span is shorter than ever. Mm. What do you think about that? Has it changed? Uh, uh, agree and disagree. Change mm. and not change. So the media will change. The mode of delivery will change, mm. but the principles will not change. So, integrated marketing communications or IMC is not a very sexy term now. I, I don't think many people uses that term anymore. In fact, it was in the late eighties and the early nineties that that was the that was the big big term that we use. Why? Before the eight uh, in in the in the mid eighties and B and before that, you could actually use one media and you could hit a lot of your consumers, right? Uh, and then um, I can't remember now, but I remember his last name, uh, Professor Schultz of uh, Northwestern University. Um, he came up with a term called integrated marketing communications, which basically means that if you combine different media in order to reach your consumer, you have a higher chances of the consumer retain, re, re, um, retaining the information and then acting upon it. Right? You could also use the context of the media in accordance to the communication that you want to deliver, right? So TV, you could tell a longer story, radio, you use it for frequency, things like that. Mm. Now, has it changed? It has not changed in the sense that integrated marketing communication still works, right? It's still the technique to be used. And a lot of people has kind of neglected it. And there are research, yeah? So these are research done by practitioners that it's not even academic by practitioners, people like Peter Field and Les Binet, they do research and they'll show you that whenever you use more than two media in order to reach your consumer, effectiveness actually go up, right? You use three, it goes up. Now I know for SME, the, 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 the challenge will always be a budget yes. uh, challenge. So I, I take this a step further. In the digital world, you can also integrate, right? So you don't just solely rely on the Facebook, solely rely on the Google. Mm. You could do your TikToks, you can do your Instagram and things like that. So you integrate. Why? We are humans. We come into different touch points at different time of our life daily, different contacts mm. as well. And that matters in communication. So in that sense, it has not changed. The, the, the human insight will not change for the longest time. Okay. Has it changed? It has. I'll be, I'll be a fool to say that it has not. Um, technology has democratized a lot of things. I mean, you and I will not be able to do this without technology, right? So i give you an example. Production of TV commercial, the price has come down drastically because of technology. So that has changed as well, right? What has changed? Um, SMEs will be very difficult to make their brands known nationwide without digital, without a Facebook, right? Mm. Right now, anyone with a credit card and a good credit limit on the credit card can run a pretty decent campaign online. So that has changed. Before this, if you're SME, I mean, besides one things that you can hang on a flag, a, 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 a lamppost, the, and leaflets that you can drop out and lots of wastage, now you can buy with a certain amount of certainty on your sock mat, right? On your social media. So that has changed. But there are also principles that has not changed. And I, I, and I think our message as Raw Point is always go back to the principles, right? 
Things can change, but the principle will never change. And that's why they are known as principles, right? If you can follow those principles, and then then, then it, it can propel you to 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 to, to greater heights. Right? Okay. When you say that, right, it reminds me of um I'm not sure whether you follow GSC on Facebook. Yeah. GSC no, I don't. the cinema no. company, right? So no. I feel like GSC to me, before this pandemic, right, has always been a very traditional, well, let's call it brick and mortar kind of business. Lah. You go there, you yeah. consume yeah. their products, which are movies, drinks, popcorn, yeah. and then you chow. But since mm. the pandemic began, right, they've been very active on social media. They post a lot of memes. They post a lot of um, relevant memes are like, oh no, suddenly today, 9,000 cases, uh, our rice bowl is going to go down the drains and whatnot. I think when you say that, it feel, it makes me it re- reinforces the brand to me, GSC as a as a very relevant company in our pop culture in a way. Yeah. But I don't think a lot of companies do it well, though. For example, I think I was mm-hmm. talking to a, a friend of mine. She said, um, "Yeah, social media is very important." But you look at a company like I think it was uh, I might be getting this wrong. I think it was L'Oreal or something. They have like mm-hmm. a million or two million followers on Facebook. Right. They just post like a product poster of their product and they get like 10 mm. likes so yeah, yeah, yeah. how do you think people should approach social media uh, after of course getting all the basics right getting all the details right as per yeah. old school marketing strategy as per I, I, IMC right yeah yeah um, I, okay so I'll go back to this so if you remember the three columns right diagnosis mm. strategy and then tactics so obviously we are talking about tactic and if in fact within tactic we are talking about the promotion P Right, so there are four P's there. You're talking about promotion P. I prefer to use um, communications or I use integrated marketing communication, so IMC. So within IMC itself, you are you also have your different media. You have your so a company like L'Oreal, obviously they probably can can afford uh, TV, radio, billboards, um, digital newspaper, whatever else. Right, you have to go back to what is your marketing objective. During this particular period, what is my marketing objective? Mm. So once you know your marketing objective, it becomes easy to know, number one, which gear to pull and how far to pull it. So if you say, look, um, awareness is not important right now. We want to hold our bullets back. I have told a lot of my SME clients, it, it's holding your bullets back. You're gonna have enough, you don't have enough bullets, right? Mm. Ideally, you would advertise now, but if you don't have enough, then we have a hard call to make, correct? Mm. So what is the objective? Go back to the objective and ask yourself, this tactic that you are doing, does it fit with the strategy? Because objective falls under the strategy column. Yeah. So, so tactics without strategy is a sure way to failure. Okay, I understand. Yeah. understand. So yeah. it's very important to consult the, the bigger picture uh, as Correct. per as per what you have recommended, like the three columns, mm. the four, the AIDAs, yeah. the four Ps. Okay, yeah. totally understand. Where do you think podcasts belong in in this in this whole in this whole sphere? It it will be under promotion. Mm. It'll be under promotion, right? So it will be under your 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 integrated marketing communications. So you're using podcasts as one of the way that you want to communicate about your brand, mm. right? And how is it that you want to establish a brand? What, what does the whole series of podcasts build you as, as, as a coach, as a trainer up? Mm. And, and, and what does it do? So it fits back into your marketing objective. I want to, um, from an awareness standpoint, I want to build you know, Bradley Lynn as what? And mm. therefore I'm doing this. Mm. You see, okay. then you can adjust based on your, your objective, you can adjust what kind of products do you do you do you create? Do you market? Mm. What kind of price point? And how do you distribute this? You see, so the, the podcast will be under will be under communications or okay. promotion. Got it, got it. One of the most valuable strategies that I learned from the course, right, was to really figure out the day in the life of my target audience, my consumer, uh, my evangelist, my 1,000 yeah. true fans, as you put it, right? Um, yeah. I'm very curious, would you say that because of this MCO now, mm. everyone's day in the life really looks very much the same? Yeah. And because of that, would it make would it mean or would it make sense that certain certain platforms or certain avenues would be more popular per se, more used at this time? Yes, definitely. What definitely. do you say that those are? 
would you say those are? Yeah. Um. So digital, obviously, right? Anything mm. that is in your hands and uh, your 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 mm. your iPad, your i your phones, and all that. So social media, digital digital um uh, uh devices would be it, and you'll be surprised. Um, and I, I know solo pronouns and, and SMEs is a bit difficult. TV is TV viewership goes up during lockdown because mm. everyone is watching TV. So mm. those those will be will be the 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 media that you can reach out. Uh, obviously, people are not traveling to offices, and therefore billboards will not be one of the one of the the main ones, right? I have not seen uh, newspaper figures, but I, I think it's probably stack stagnate right now because people are the, the the people who don't book a daily hard copy of it will also come down but electronic newspapers obviously has gone up as well right readership of electronic newspapers have gone up because people want to keep in touch with the news so if you do the a day in the life mm. you can you can't escape that as well so it's again it's one of those if you remember i say the the old techniques actually still works now <laughs> So just to just to quickly share, I think a day in the life for listeners who are curious is to uh, identify who your target audience is, and you run a simulation to see what they do from the moment they wake up, what they consume. Is it through their phone? Is it through TV? When they drive to work, what channels they listen to, all the way till uh, when they go to bed. So that has been a very important one for me uh, back before this pandemic happened, uh, to figure out where is it that the customers that would most likely purchase my products, purchase my coaching service, my training service, where would they spend the most time with? So it's very important to go through that that work and very important yeah. to write it down. Don't just let it be in your mind swimming around. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm taking up a lot of your time, so I'm going to quickly just go to some of the more, the last few questions, which I think are very important, right? We are undoubtedly going through a relatively or rather tough time now. I'm not going to sugarcoat my words for a lot yeah. of industries out there. Mm. Um, a lot of industries have been badly hit. How would you suggest they, and it's a very broad question, it's a very badly worded question, but how would you suggest industries or companies that have been badly crushed at this time react though? What would be a first step that they should do? I think the first step is to diagnose yourself and ask yourself where, where you are in terms of your business. Mm. So there are many, many, many categories. Um, sadly, there are some that is, is freeze. You, you, can't, you can't do anything. I think tourism, mm -hmm. hotel, and things like that. Yeah, those, those, are, the, those are the tough ones. I think um, you need to diagnose where you are right now. You need to look at your cash flow position. So those, those are the important ones to look at. How is your industry being affected? I don't like the term pivot because I, I, don't, I don't quite believe in the word pivot as, 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 as what most people are using it. But for those kind of industry, you, I think it's a good time to look at what is your core competency and what is it that you can offer in order to overcome the situation right now. Because obviously it's survival, right? So how do you, you know, build the cash flow? How do you ensure that you actually last beyond this particular period? I think that's important. Mm. I think the other one, the other group that is kind of in the middle, neither affected nor unaffected. My advice is use the extra time to do planning. Even, and, and make some assumption. I know it's a moving target because this, this thing is oscillating. It's just kind of up and down, up and down and all that. Mm. E even if you take the political situation out of the equation, the, the virus is going to be around for some time. Um, scientists are already saying that it's going to be endemic. Make some, make some good guesses, right? Uh, and say, how long is it going to last for us? And during this time, what is it that you can do in terms of your plan? So the moment it opens, right? What are the, some of the things that you are implementing instead of when it opens and you start planning? You have extra time now. Don't, don't waste it. Use it to plan and put in place a plan in order to do it. Then obviously there are the third group who is obviously you can flex, right? Those who are doing well, you're doing online, you're doing... Um, certain certain kind of food categories or, or nutrition category and, and, and all that, 
I mean, go to town with it, right? This is a time to invest behind your brand. This is a time to 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 go go out there and, and make the money. So I, I think you need to ask yourself which group of company you are in and then implement the correct strategy to it. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you. That's very um, wide-ranging in a good way because I think you cover mm. the three companies that the companies that might fall into the three categories, right? Where they are yeah. strugglers, they are in status quo or they are thriving. Thank mm. you. Something I got to re-listen to to plan how to yeah. move forward. Um, the last segment I want to talk about is uh, something that I think is more relevant to me, personal branding. I want to okay. say through this whole podcast, when I use the word marketing, branding, advertising, I'm very self-conscious because I'm talking mm. to a marketing guru. And <laughs> sometimes, I, sometimes I may, I may, uh, I think I may have used certain wrong words, uh, but do correct me if I'm using it wrongly. Uh. But one thing that I've recently come to realize is that people follow people. Individuals can sometimes become larger than brands, right? For example, mm. Uh, mm. recently, I'm not sure whether you follow the Euro, Ronaldo mm. recently took uh, the Coca-Cola bottle away from his press conference and the yeah. market cap of uh, Coke, I think, dropped by 4 billion. And <laughs> I, I don't know whether this is, how would you look at it in the grand scheme of things? Because for example, even Raw Point, right? Um, mm. uh, you have always been a very front-facing person because uh, some of mm. the interviews that you do and yeah. uh, the articles that you write. So I find that one of the main reasons why I've uh, chosen to take up the program is because I've met you in person. I know who you mm. are. And mm. boom, just through that, I, I was uh, a yeah. customer for your course and I'm a huge advocate for it. I think everyone should attend it if they want to know about or learn marketing the right way. How yeah. do you view this statement, people follow people? Because I think it seems to me that's the reason why content creators, people are trying to be more individualized as brands per se. Mm. I, I think it's an excellent question, uh, Bradley, because um, I, I also know that there are a lot of uh, personal branding gurus out there. Mm. I think whether you're talking about a personal brand or you're talking about a, a kind of a service brand or a, or a product brand, if you ask me, they are the same. They're the same because at the end of the day, you're still talking about who is your segment, who is your target, what is the position that you take. It, it, it doesn't run away, mm. right? So I think that's an important part. Uh, people follow people. Well, I agree to it. At the end of the day, it's like your question on the podcast. Where does a podcast fit in? You've got to ask yourself. So people follow people. At the end of the day, if you ask me, f falls under the promotion bit as well because then it's word of mouth, right? All communication at the end of the day is trying to spur word of mouth. Whether I'm doing a TV ad, a social media ad, a, a TikTok video, that at the end of the day, I want someone to talk about me to their friends. So they become your advocates, your evangelists. Mm. Right? So as far as personal branding is concerned, it's the same thing. I am Long Yun Siang or I'm Bradley Lin. Who am I? What is the position that I take versus whom? It doesn't have to be versus another personal trainer or another coach. It can be against a current behavior. So I'm a coach. I'm helping people to better themselves. Mm. What am I against? I'm against current behavior nonchalance, for example, right? I'm against uh, procrastination. People know, hey, do you think this course is good for you, uh, Mr. Long? Yeah, 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 it's good for you. Would you like to take a package of a 12 classes? Uh, maybe later. So you are fighting against that. So what is the position that you take, right? So that, that becomes the positioning. So once you have that, how you communicate, again, goes back down to what are the media that you should be using? And what is the message that you should be saying? So no different from a product or a brand and, 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 and things like that at all. Okay, yeah. okay. So ultimately, what I'm hearing you say is we still have to really consult the basics or as you put it, old school marketing because hmm. no matter what, how we, no matter based on this past hour of conversation, right? I feel like no matter how I try to spin it, social media, la, podcast, la, personal brand, la, blah, 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 still very important for me to kind of consult the big picture, the grand scheme of things, segmentize my audience, figure out yes. the day in their life, figure out, diagnose where, where my business is right now. So, okay, this has been, <laughs> this has been a wonderful realization for me. I need to sit down and do the work. Yeah. One last question that, per, that relates to personal branding, right, is the fact that, yeah. and I know you don't like the word pivot, 
So I'm not going to use the yeah. word pivots. No, it's okay. <laughs> use it. So I'm no, going to use the word. Even, yeah. I'm going to use the word recreates. Yeah. Uh, which is the same thing, like essentially. Yeah. Now, this is a personal uh, journey I'm going through. Uh, I've been a fitness trainer for the longest time, maybe mm. the past seven, eight years, right? <clears throat> mm. And I enjoy what I do. I super enjoy what I do. But I've also taken up coaching. Yeah. Coaching in the broad sense of, um, you can call it life coaching, where you sit down mm. with people, you try to help them through some of their business struggles, their personal struggles. I still haven't figured mm. out a niche to, date, to that yet. One thing that I read in the book, um, Positioning, is mm. that line extension can often be dangerous. Which mm. means that, hey, if I'm Toyota, for example, suddenly I go sell, mm. I sell like a detergent. It doesn't mm. make sense. Uh, it doesn't fit into yeah. my umbrella of my products. How mm. would you go about, in that sense, how would you go about line extending? Ah, excellent question. Mm. Be- beautiful question. Let me explain. Okay, so this is, so we, we talk a lot about old school, or I call it classic, classic marketing, classical, you know, marketing strategy models and all that. that that's why it, it, it never, it never detracts away from the principle. Um, personal trainers, right? I mean, now I'm sure there are a lot of equipments and things like that for people to bodybuild, for, to keep healthy. But you balik balik, come back to compound exercise, ma. squat, deadlift, mm. bench press, pull up. You will not run away from it, one. You can cater, change the program. The trainer somehow will fit in some of this, right? Because you know, depending on what the objective is, but you, you will never run away from 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 those, right? It, it's the same thing. If I use UFC for example, it, it well kind of like the modern way of fighting, but grappling, kicking, punching, throwing. Hey, mm. since cavemen, <laughs> they've been using it. <laughs> I love that example, man. Right. So the, the principle the principle doesn't change. Mm. So to to come back to your to your question, um can can you repeat the question again, Bradley? How how should I recreate myself from going to okay. coaching uh, as a background uh, as a fitness trainer? Yeah, yeah, brand extension. Mm. Brand extension and line extension. Okay. There are, there is a difference between brand extension and line extension. So most people they don't understand. So if you do brand management, then you know that there's a there's a there's a difference, there's a difference to it. Mm. Let me let me explain. And why why do I like this question? Is because if you don't see the bigger picture, you you tend to think that you are lying and standing yourself, but you're not. Mm. Marketing objective, right, is very related to corporate objective. Most people don't realize this. Corporate okay? objective. Corporate objective. So when you talk about corporate objective, you talk about co- core competencies. Mm, okay. Okay. So what is Bradley's core competency? Bradley's core competency is to help people improve. If I help people improve, I started by helping people to improve physically. Mm. Now I'm helping people improve mentally or in a more holistic fashion, for example. So that line extension is not one that it detracts away from positioning. I see. So your chances of succeeding is higher because I can help people improve physically. I'm now helping people improve in another way. So my core competency is about helping people improve. So take a step so back think, and look at the bigger picture. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Correct, correct. So you are brand extending. When you brand extend, you are taking the value from the brand and then rubbing it off on another category. Mm. Now that you must know what is that value that you're translating. Obviously, if you're taking Bradley Lim and you're selling chili sauce, it won't work. <laughs> you see? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you can't translate. But tomorrow, so you're not doing coaching. Use another example. If tomorrow you become a financial consultant, okay, it right, somewhat relates. I feel yes, but the personal coaching you will likely do slightly better than financial. Understand? Okay, it's still in the same. It's still helping people improve, but now it slightly further. Okay, you see that? So it, it comes back to it comes back to what is the core competency? What are you truly good at? Got it. Right. Okay, got it, got it. 
Thank you, thank you. That was very valuable. That was very important. Yeah. What, what are the examples of um, successful brand extensions or land extensions that you guys at Raw Point have worked with before? If you can wow, tough for me to think <laughs> of right now. Very tough to think of right now. Um, hard to hard for me to tell you. Don't have no worries, no worries. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, long I've taken out a lot of your time, so I'm going to end today with just some rapid fire questions. Uh, okay. Short questions <laughs> where the answers doesn't necessarily have to be short. You can take your time with it. Um, sure. If you could put a billboard on the busiest street in KL, what would it say? Well, um, it would say, it would say for now. Okay. It would say for now. Just two words for now. Uh, mainly, I, I think my message to people is that whatever your conclusion is, right, it's only for now because you have not seen the long term. So I, I go back to, you know, about an hour ago and we talked about if you take a long term view of things, things actually changes. Um, it, it can change quite a lot. It can change quite a lot. So for now, it means whatever that you believe in is only the information that you have for now. It mm -hmm. might change later. And, and, and to be able to be open minded and humble enough to say the information has changed. Got right. It. I, I would change the view. So for now, and I, I think it goes back to uh, a core principle that I, I, I try to teach myself, um, not succeeding at it, but that's why I have these two words in my mind. It goes back to impermanence, right? Everything is for now. I, I know you speak Mandarin, so it's Wu Chang. So mm -hmm. Wu Chang is not just life. Wu Chang is it's ideas as well. Ideas and, and expositions and opinions that you have is for now. Based on the information that you have is for now. Right? Or things that you believe in. I want to be, I don't know how successful, how successful. For now, you want this. Hmm. When you have kids, you may not want it anymore. <laughs> right? Thank so you for that like, wisdom. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, for now is a more succinct way of um, saying, I think I have this written somewhere when I read it, I really like it. It says, uh, yeah. you are a constant recreation of your masterpiece or something like that. Yeah. For now is yeah. a much nicer, much more wise way to say it, I gotta say. Okay. What would you tell your 30 year old self at this point? Uh, I think a few things. Uh, I think one is don't waste time. I think when you're younger, mm. you think you'll live forever, right? So don't waste time. Um, pursue, give yourself a few, a few goals that is worthwhile pursuing. Whatever it is, I, 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 it, it could be spiritual, it could be intellectual, it could be financial. Um, any amount of, 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 of goals, just pick a few and, and have a long-term view of it and then keep pursuing those. You, you, you think you will live forever, you don't. When you reach 40, 50, your life changes, uh, your, your, the, the phase of your life changes and you will start to think more about some of the things that, the time that you have wasted Right, so yeah, I think give yourself some long term goals that is worth pursuing. I think, I think that's that's one of it. Number two is you don't know what you don't know. I think this is something that I, I speak very very often, um, and be a bit be a bit humble and listen listen more to people who have been there. I mean, I have I have criticized a lot of my bosses and my seniors and things like that, but I'm I'm going through what they went through. Right, I think now now they are in, in, in their sixties and all that. I'm going through what they they went through and with my people, with my staff or people that have gone through. And I think be humble, I think be able to to you are young, you see a lot of new things, no doubt. But there are also things that you have not seen yet and be open to it. You don't believe in it, but don't run them down. L listen listen and then reflect and then put it as part of your arsenal. I think those are the, I think probably the two main things I will tell a 30, my 30 year old self. Okay. Okay. Very much reflects with um, your billboard of for now. Yeah. <laughs> How has your outlook on life changed though after this one and a half year of lockdown, if any? Mm, how have I changed? I think, I think, I, I use the term, the word broadly. La. I think it has made me even more paranoid about, about how things can change immediately. Mm. Um, I've got a friend's, uh, I've got a friend's father um, who in, during, the first, during the first MCO was struck with Parkinson and, and, and things like that. Um, got friends who, 
lost their job, closed their companies and, and all that. Um, so I think during this, this year, year and a half or so, I think it has taught me to be really to be prepared. Um, but if you ask me how, how much to be prepared, I don't know. But I know at least financially, for example, a bit too late for people like me now. Um, but I think I, I would tell my kids and say, maybe even have a pandemic fund, you know. Right? The moment you hit your work age, start to pack small money aside and, and, and in your lifetime, because when you get into work, I, I don't know, 25, you have another 30 years. And, and if, if you, based on what scientists are saying that it's, it's going to be more common, you know it's going to come again in, in, in your life cycle, in your lifetime, then how are you prepared for it? I suppose you may have to have like six months of funds put aside and say, if I don't have a job, it's okay. I can lift off this particular fund and you don't touch it. For example, uh, so I, I think it make me more, I, I use the word paranoid so that I give it some urgency. Got it. I mean, if I put it in a less sexy term, it would be, you have to be prepared. Like, you really have to be prepared for the unexpected. Uh. Okay. 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 One last question, right? What are you most excited to do once we get through this? What am I most excited to do? So I, I, I practice what I preach. Uh, one Hun and I, we have been planning our marketing plan, uh, rejuggle the marketing plan because things have been thrown topsy-turvy, right? Uh, the moment is over, we are going to execute our marketing plan. Uh, we are also going to execute our training plan internally as well to upskill mm -hmm. some, some of the staff, uh, uh, our own people, so that we are geared. Um, we can only assume that our marketing plan works. If our marketing plan works, you get more business, our people has to be ready for it. So I'm most excited for that. Okay, okay. I'm very excited for that for you as well. Um, I know you, you guys are going to run a, a course come when things are normal and physical classes can be held again. I'm very excited to that's go right. for a quick refresher if that's possible. Um, okay, where can people find you, Long? Where can people find you and your work uh, online or anywhere? I think you can go to our, go to our website, raw-points.com. Um, then from there, it will lead you to our Facebook if you want to read our, our blog. Um, the blog is actually a, a blog spot. It's actually raw points, R-A-W-P-O-I-N-T-S dot blogspot.com. But once you find our website, um, you, you, you'll bring you to the Facebook, you'll bring you to, to our blog. That's, that's how you can find us. Yeah. Okay. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. Okay, okay. All right. I, I just want to reiterate, I know I said this a lot of times, I think the uh, accelerator course, the masterclass that you guys uh, held was really important for me uh, to really understand what direction I needed to go as a solo pruner slash personal brand slash one-man show. And I think that most people who are stuck or lost or have no idea how to go about the wide-ranging role of marketing and branding, you have to have to really consider taking up the course with Raw Points. I'm not being Thank paid you. to say this. It's a personal feedback of mine. I really, really enjoyed the, the class. Okay. Uh, Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time today, Long. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you for having me. Take My care. Owner. I will see you, you. see you really, really soon. Okay, All see right. you too. Bye-bye.